Good evening and welcome to the latest of our midweek Bible studies. We're so glad you're able to join us this evening in this online format. We trust you be blessed as we study God's word together and as we seek his grace to apply it in our lives. We're going to be continuing this evening with the theme that has been our preoccupation over these months, the theme of evangelical holiness. And we've slowed our study right down and we're looking together at the fruit of the spirit that Galatians chapter 5 teaches to us. So in a moment, we're going to read that passage and study it together. But before we do, let's bow together, please, and let's pray. Father, thank you for this new and fresh opportunity that we have to open your word together, to study it, and to ask you, Lord, to scrutinise our lives in the light of your word, to give us teachable spirits, and to give us a will and a conscience which readily submits to what you say, what you ordain, and what you desire of us. So, Father God, I pray as we meet this way, as we study your word, that you would bless us and help us, that you'd fill us with your spirit so that we might bear the fruit of your spirit and that in understanding how we ought to live, you would give us grace so to live. Help me as I speak this evening, Lord God, I pray. Help those who would listen. And we pray for those who have gathered in our building this evening and are likewise studying your word. Bless George as he would teach there and bless all who gather. We commit our way to you this evening now, Lord God, and ask that you'd help us for Christ's sake. Amen. We're returning once again this evening to Galatians chapter 5. We have been reading and studying from this passage over the past number of weeks. We're going to read from verse 16 down to verse 26, and then we're going to study in particular the content of verse 22. So Galatians chapter 5, commencing to read at verse 16. This is what the word of God says. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. This is God's word and we know he'll bless it to our hearts as we've read it together. To read Galatians chapter 5, to read about the fruit of the Spirit, is to be fundamentally challenged about our Christian lives and our growth in our grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul here has been sharing about the conflict and the battle that all true believers face as they seek to walk with the Lord Jesus Christ through this world. There is this deeply personal and internalised conflict between the flesh and the spirit There are the old desires that the Christian remembers and recognises from their time before they came to Christ. And there are their new desires, this new impetus that is given to them by the indwelling and by the power of the Holy Spirit. So where once for the Christian there was contentment with carnality, there was a sense of acquiescence in what the flesh demanded. Now, as those who belong to Christ, they feel an inner resistance towards those old behaviours as the Spirit works in them. And they feel the resistance of the flesh against the work of the Holy Spirit. So often they find themselves vexed. They find themselves perplexed by this war that's waged within their hearts and within their souls. The Apostle Paul is writing to the Galatian believers. This is not a body of perfect people with pristine Christian lives. These are individuals whose grasp on the gospel of grace had been significantly weakened through false teaching, through a teaching which was trying to draw them and suck them back into keeping the works of the law as a way to get to the Lord. And also we can read from Galatians 5 that relationally these believers left a lot to be desired. They had a propensity and a tendency to 
bite and devour one another, to be divisive, to be hostile to one another, and also to become conceited, uh, Galatians 5.26, to provoke one another and envy one another. And so both personally and collectively, these believers were in much need of the Spirit to work more fully in their hearts and in their lives, to know that greater sense of occupation and empowerment from God so that they might serve him. And Paul, speaking into that whole set of circumstances, outlines for them and reminds them what the evident works of the flesh are, what it was merely to live for appetite, what it was to live for self and for sin. And he contrasts that very powerfully with what it is now to keep in step with the Spirit, to live according to the person and the power of the third person of the Godhead. And so the Apostle Paul, in spelling out the fruit of the Spirit, is both showing what should be evident in their lives and what should be pursued by them as individual Christians. And on Wednesday nights, we've been finding this teaching coming very close to home and very close to our hearts. We have been challenged to do some auditing and self-assessment to what degree is this fruit being born in our lives? Are we loving Christians? Are we joyful in our approach to what life throws at us? Are we peaceful in terms of seeking to make peace with those around us? This evening, we come to the next description of that fruit of the Spirit in the Christian's life. We're going to look this evening at this theme of patience and perhaps more so than even in these other early manifestations of the fruit of the Spirit, we're going to find that our attitudes, our hearts, our actions, our lives, the way we behave ourselves both domestically, uh, congregationally and individually will be put under the microscope and exposed to our sight. And so we need to approach what Paul will teach here about the fruit of the Spirit prayerfully, self-consciously, humbly and openly, that God might further work in us so that we have become what he would wish us to be. So this evening we're thinking about the fact that, as Paul says in Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit is patience. We're going to think through something of the nature of patience and we're going to think through something then about areas where we can seek to see that brought to bear, where we can ask God for grace um, to, to bring that to fruition in our lives. So this evening I want to look at this theme of patience from two particular angles. I want to talk to you first of all about examples of patience and then I want us to look together at the exhortations to patience. Now I've said in previous studies that the fruit of the Spirit challenges us both as preacher and as hearers of the Word of God. Very often what we do with Scripture is we take it in its context, we uh, work out the internal workings of a passage and then think through how it applies but the fruit of the Spirit forces us to take a much broader canvas, to look at a much bigger picture in order to understand what this fruit should look like. And so this evening, by looking at examples and at exhortations, I hope that we'll get to the heart and to the root of what Paul is aiming at when he says that this fruit of patience should be born out in our lives. So first of all, then, this evening, let's think together about examples of patience. It's very common in the commentaries as you read through them and in book length treatments of the fruit of the Spirit for authors, for thinkers, for preachers to have recourse to examples of patience. One of the best ways that we can think about a behaviour is to see it embodied. Recently, when Jack Charlton passed away, uh, people reflected on his personality and they talked a little bit about his humility. And as people thought about that, those familiar with Jack Charlton's life would be able to think, well, that must be what humility looks like in some sense and to some degree. The example illuminated what the word meant as well as the word capturing who the person was. And so examples of patience this evening will help us to know what Galatians 5 is drawing our hearts and minds towards. And in most of the commentaries, the examples that are given are of God himself. And that's very worthwhile, very helpful, because if we think about God in his person, if we think about God in his identity and in his being, then we come to see that patience is at the very heart of how God relates to us and relates to our world. You might think of the patience of God with us as mere human beings. Chris Wright and his commentary on the fruit of the Spirit draws out for us the patience of God with his Old Testament people. And really, if you look at the, the history of Israel and the history of the kingdoms of Judah and Israel, you'll find that patience is written right across the door frames of that whole house, that whole story, that whole narrative and account. Whether you go back to the earliest days of Genesis, whenever God patiently waited for men and women to repent before the flood and the judgment of God came. Whether you think about God's patience with the ultimate forebear of faith, um, Abraham, 
how God led him and how God renewed him and helped him even in his failures. And you can see that even more so in his immediate sons in the lives of the patriarchs, God's great patience. You think about God's patience with his people whom he delivered out of Egypt. God patiently led them through the wilderness and they really tried God's patience. They really pushed God's patience to the absolute limit and yet God was long suffering towards them. Uh, Moses was able to say that the Lord is slow to anger. There is this sense in God that he's not precipitative. He's, he's, not, he's not on a, on a hair trigger. He doesn't have a short fuse, but he patiently watches with and walks with and waits for his people to follow after him. And if you think about the history of the kingdoms of Israel and Judah over and over again, we see God patiently sending prophets to speak to the hearts of his people. That was summarised by the Lord Jesus in the, the parable he taught about the vineyard where God sends servant after servant. And even though those spokesmen are mistreated and mishandled and martyred, God still is faithful and sends his son. So the patience of God is richly exemplified in the Old Testament. This, this God who is, of course, a consuming fire, this God who is of white hot holiness, this God whose presence is so pure and so holy that it's intolerable to the hearts and minds of sinful men and women, and yet a God who, who is gracious and, and fatherlike, and he tends and spares his people over and over again. The Lord Jesus emphasised that in his own teaching as well. As he spoke in the parable of the barren fig tree, he shared about the fact that, that there was this concern on God's part not to, to move early, not to, not to intervene at, at an early stage, even though there was no fruit, but to, to give it another year, to, to water the plant, to put on manure and fertiliser and wait and watch that fruit might yet be born. So if you want to understand what patience is, we, we don't have recourse, first of all, to individuals in the media or even to famous Christians. We look into the very heart of the Godhead and we see that God himself characterises this divine patience. We see it in the Lord Jesus Christ as well. We think about his patience both with the crowds and with his followers. He was patient with his opponents. He, he faithfully explained over and over again the, the principles and priorities of the kingdom of God, even though there was such hostility and, and hatred directed towards him on the part of the religious rulers. We think about his patience as he, he stood over Jerusalem and, and wept for the city that it would not repent, that he, he would have gathered them and, and brought them as a mother hen draws its chicks under its wings, but they were unwilling. Jesus showed such, such patience and, and forbearance. And we see the patience of Jesus even with his sufferings. We think about the fact that even though there was so much in him that, that, that physically drew back from the, the ordeal of going to the cross, we, we see him as, as an individual who sweats great drops of blood in the face of God's providential plan. Yet he patiently endured. And he patiently went to the cross. We might even say he patiently died. He could have called down cohorts of angels to deliver him and yet he patiently endured. The writer to the Hebrews and encouraging the believers who were struggling with their faith. Hebrews 12 points them to the example of the Lord Jesus. He says we should look to him, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. And the calling that the writer to the Hebrews puts on those believers is that they should both share in Jesus' endurance and share in his enjoyment. Patience is part of what we see in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. We see his patience with his followers. He, he didn't give up on them. Gentle and lowly of heart. They often misunderstood. They often got the wrong end of the stick. They often put party politics and personal preference before the, the principles of the kingdom. But Jesus patiently taught them. And he could exclaim that they're of little faith. He could say to them, how long will I be with you? And you'll still not understand. But he was patient with them. And so we see in God's relationship with human beings, God the Father and God the Son, patience is so important. We see that example as well in the ministry of the Apostle Paul, the, the one who under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit writes Galatians 5, was not urging on these believers that they would bear fruit that his life did not exemplify itself. And so Paul very often would point to the fact that, that part of how he lived and how he ministered, how he worked with local churches, how he evangelised, how he planted churches, was through patience. If you turn with me for a moment over to Second Timothy, 
2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 10. The Apostle Paul encourages Timothy to, to bear out in his life what Paul has borne on his own. 2 Timothy 3.10, Paul says to Timothy, You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings. Paul says, Timothy, you, you know by experience, you know by serving alongside me, you know by facing the same hardships and horrors that I have, that in those trials, you observed that I was a patient servant of Christ Jesus. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, as Paul ministers about weakness and, and ministers about his own ministry priorities, if you, if you look at that passage, 2 Corinthians 6, in verse 6, Paul says, the part of how he, he bears out his ministry is by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love and so on. So in the armory of Paul's ministry and the toolbox of his work and the fibres of his life and the, and the fabric of his, of his Christianity as a man living in the first century, he was someone who not only had patience but was known for patience, was reputed for patience and saw that as part of God's work. In his heart and in his life. And so bearing with things, holding off in judgment, not being reactive, not being precipitative, is exampled and modeled for us in the Godhead and it's exampled for us in the individual who, under the inspiration of the Spirit, writes these words that shows to us what patience looks like. Patience is, is tried in the, in the tough environment of adversity and difficulty. And it's a fruit that's born amidst the many briars and the many brambles of of hardship and hostility and persecution that being a follower of Christ entails. And so we have these examples of patience that help us to define this word that we find in Galatians 5.22. Not only that, but we find that there are exhortations to patience. Now it's so important that we bear in mind all the time when we're reading Galatians 5 that the Apostle Paul is saying that these virtues that are listed out are the fruit of the Spirit. Paul is not here urging on these believers a, a heavy yoked moralism. He's not laying on their shoulders an obligation that by sheer weight of grit and determination, they should grudgingly live according to this code. Rather, he's saying part of the natural outflow of the Holy Spirit dwelling within you is that these virtues will, will be embodied by you and will be evident to others. And there's a connectedness in what Paul talks about here in the fruit of the Spirit. And so love, joy, peace, patience, we can see that there's a linkage between those. Certainly Paul in those exemplary sections that we've read from in, in 2 Timothy 3 and 2 Corinthians 6, he, he ties together love and kindness and patience with the work that God's doing in his life. This is, this is the fruit of the Spirit. In fact, Paul could say in 1 Corinthians 13 that love is patient, love is kind, etc., and so we're, we're not, in a sense, doing a post-mortem on the fruit of the Spirit and drawing them out and not saying that there's connective branches between them and, and other parts of Christian life. But not only do we see that this is the fruit of the Spirit, but as is the case with all holiness, not only does the Spirit bear this fruit in our lives, but the Spirit puts in our hearts to pursue this fruit in our lives. We've seen this over and over again, that the, the Christian idea of growth is not merely passive it's not something that happens to the Christian against their will, against their wishes or against the grain of their life. Rather, the Holy Spirit predisposes the believer to seek after the fruit that he bears in their life. It's that amazing and mysterious dynamic of Christian growth. And likewise, patience is urged in Christians over and over again. We'll come back to this passage in a moment or two. But in James chapter 5, Christians are urged to be patient in their sufferings. It's expected in the New Testament that Christians will face such dreadful hardships and difficulties that the, the way of following Christ is not a, a rose-strewn um, driveway to glory, but rather it's a rubbled road full of um, potholes and potential ruin bordered by bandits who would divest us of all of our hope and all of our joy. Those are images that John Bunyan very graphically illustrated in Pilgrim's Progress that the Christian's journey to heaven is, is strewn with wreckage and, and difficulty and trouble and trial and, and pain and difficulty. 
And the New Testament urges us as believers that this patience, this fruit of the Spirit be, be borne out when we're at our worst and when things are at their toughest. And James chapter 5, James takes these believers back to Job in the Old Testament. He says, there's an example of patience. There's a man who was bereft of everything, his, his income, his livelihood, his security, his, his family, even the integrity of his relationship with his wife and the integrity of his friendship with his counsellors was strained and, and troubled and trialed and his own health broke down. And yet he held on to hope. He was patient and waiting for God. And so as believers, there's an exhortation to us to be patient in our sufferings. Patience, in other words, is a, a fruit that's not born through um, putting ourselves in a laboratory or locking ourselves in a cloister and meditating until we become mindful enough that we can then be at peace with the world. It's, it's born out in the hurly-burly of, of living with other people and living with difficulty and enduring pain and difficulty. And by that, learning patience. So the Apostle Paul in Romans 5 can talk about adversity in the Christian's life and part of the byproduct of that adversity is patience and hope. And so as we are tried, as we are, as we are stretched, as the, as the fabric of our life seems to be thin and patchy and inadequate and vulnerable, God in those very moments is, is building into us an endurance and a patience that will hold on until his coming. Not only that, but we are to be patient with other people. Not merely patient with the, the issues that come to our door, but the individuals who come into our lives. We are called to be patient people. Ephesians chapter 4, if you look there with me, bears so many parallels to the fruit of the Spirit that Paul talks about in Galatians 5. And in Ephesians 4, Paul says to these believers, verse 1, that they are to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which they've been called with all humility and gentleness with patience and then he follows that with these words bearing with one another in love eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace so patience is is demonstrated as we we live in the interface of christian fellowship and christian community that is not always automatically harmonious and is not always automatically easy for us to enjoy patience is to be born out in our relationships with other believers we are to be patient with one another and what does that mean it means that we bear with one another in love that our bond in Christ is so strong and so primary and so important that we will be willing to overlook in others what we would wish them to overlook in us that when we disagree that we find it difficult to to combine and to unify our thinking with other believers that we walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which we've been called, part of which is just being plain, patient, putting up with the foibles and the inadequacies, even at times the wrong thinking of others. Whenever Timothy is, is called to declare the whole counsel of God, he's to do it with all patience and teaching. He's not to flare up, he's not to throw in the towel, he's not to, to, to storm out of the room and, and leave everyone else alone, he's not to throw the toys out of the cot, but he's to be patient. It's to bear with these believers. And Paul says to these Ephesians, that's what you're to do. You're to see as primary, maintaining the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And part of how that unity is borne out is by being patient with one another. By not getting riled. By not being people who are so easy to offend or easy to upset or easy to annoy, but being those who are of a tranquil spirit and of an enduring fortitude and a forbearance that, that, that demonstrates a commitment, a baseline commitment to Christ and his people. That's, that's one of the exhortations, the patience that we find in the New Testament. And then finally, there's an exhortation to, to wait, to wait for the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, we have reference here to James chapter 5, if you would come across that passage for a moment or two. James 5. Verse 7, here's what James says, Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Hold the judge is standing at the door. Do you see the combination there? <laughs> 
of patience in community and patience for Christ's coming. James says that as believers we are, are to live with this stamina-minded faith. We're to sow and we're to wait and we're to watch and we're to long for Jesus to come but we're to do that patiently, expectantly but patiently. God is patient and waiting to send the Son. Second Peter chapter 3 verse 9 tells us that God is long-suffering. Not desiring that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is, is waiting to gather his people home. And as believers, we are to wait to be gathered home. And as we do, we to be patient with Christ, James 5, and patient with one another. Not grumbling, but bearing with each other. Now the application of these truths is simple, but it's searching and it's difficult. Galatians 5.22 tells us that part of the work of the Spirit in our lives is that we bear the fruit of patience. How's your patience? How much of this fruit is being born in your life? Are you patient in suffering? Or do we panic in suffering? Do we patiently endure the, the crosses and losses that life in this fallen world bring? Or do we constantly bristle against providence? Are we constantly lifting our fists towards heaven? And doubting God's goodness and his timing. How's our patience with other people? We're searched about that domestically. Would our family describe us as patient people? Is our Christianity reaching that far? Do we bear with one another? Are we willing to, to care and love and show such kindness to those around us in our families that, that we can be patient, that we can set aside our timetable and our priorities and bear with them? Are we patient with the faults of other people in our homes? Because if we're not, then we need to hear this exhortation and we need, when we're praying that John Stott prayer that we talked about a number of weeks ago, where he got up every morning and asked that God would specifically bear the fruit of the Spirit in his life, maybe we need to say the word patience a bit louder than the other words. What about in the local church? Are we being patient with one another? Are we bearing with one another? Are we allowing things to take their course in the lives of others? Are we waiting for, for further Christian growth in their, in their lives so that they, they, they will grow through some of the seasons that perhaps frustrate us and some of the behaviours that grit and grind against us? Are we patient with people who wrong us or upset us or who don't share absolutely everything that we do, who don't dot all our I's and cross all our T's? Are we showing that kind of patience to one another? Because if we're not, then that's a lack of spirituality. Galatians 5 contrasts the fruit of the Spirit with the works of the flesh. And the works of the flesh, we are told, are divisions, envy. We're told that there are fits of anger when we live according to the flesh. That's the opposite of patience. Do we need to repent of impatience towards our brothers and sisters in Christ? What about patience for Christ's coming? What about waiting and watching and working and serving and labouring and hoping that that endurance will lead to the day when we see him? Well, I'm quite assured there's work for me to do here. I'm quite assured there are prayers for me to pray here. And I'm equally assured that there are for you too.
It's been fascinating to, to watch what God's been saying to us from his word consistently over these past weeks about our love for one another, our patience with one another, our bearing with one another at a time when those properties and those priorities are in short supply. And how tragic it would be for God to speak so clearly and so candidly to us and for us to set that aside and keep on pursuing the path that we're on. I'm going to go away and pray about these things. Perhaps you should too. Say, Father God, by your spirit, bear in my life more of this fruit of patience with my sufferings, with my family, with my brothers and sisters in Christ and help me to look patiently for the coming of your son. Would you join me in that prayer? Would you ask that God would grow us more in this area? Would you ask with me now that God would bless his word to our hearts? Amen. We're going to bow together and pray as we close this evening's Bible study. Father, we know that it's such a humbling thing to open your word, to hear what you've said, and then to place in parallel our lives and our hearts. We need you, Lord God, by your Spirit to quicken us and to revive us and to help us to bear more of this fruit of patience in every area of our lives. To look at the example that is set for us, Almighty God, by you and by your servants through the ages. And then to heed these exhortations. And to seek to put our faith into practice with those most intimate with us. And with the hope that is most ultimate to us. Thank you for your help as we studied your word this evening. Bless us through the rest of this day and in the days to come. Help us not to leave your word and then just... Go on into what else has to happen in our homes tonight, but to take a moment now to pray personally and to ask you graciously to work in us what you ask of us for your glory and for Christ's sake. Amen.